everyone. My name is Yvette. Welcome to Awaken to Life Center and our new video series, which is called I Didn't Know That. We're happy to have you with here with us today. We also say hello to the Zoom folks out there in Zoom land. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for being here. Just a little few little housekeeping things before we before we start. We also have a, a little audience here. Mwah. Thank you guys for all coming here as well. Uh, we know it's the age of technology, so if anybody has, we ask if anybody has a cell phone or anything like that, if they could go ahead and put that on mute so that it doesn't go off during the, the session. Um, also, the folks that are on Zoom, if you have any questions or anything that you want to ask, Scott will have a little Q&A at the end. Same thing for the studio audience here. There's a Q&A pod right there on the Zoom. There's a Zoom toolbar at the bottom, and it says Q&A. You can go ahead and put your question in that. Pamela will graciously be back there monitoring that and we can go ahead and get your question and we can go ahead and do that at the end for the Q&A pod. Don't put it in the chat, otherwise we'll think you're just chatting, which is perfectly fine, but we won't get, catch your question and you're important. So we want to make sure we want to make sure we get all that. Okay, so I think I've got that same thing here for the, uh, the audience. Be thinking of questions that you may want to ask uh, during the end and at the, at the end, we do have a mic that will be roaming around and we'll have a little Q&A for Scott at the end if you guys have some questions. Okay, I think that about does it for the housekeeping things. Uh, so today we are in for a treat. I know I always say that, but it's actually true. We're in for a treat. We have Scott Pressler, who I've been wanting to meet forever, that is in, in the house today. So we thank you. You've probably known him. He's the millennial who's kind of taken the world by storm, cleaning up things, all about love and action, actually doing, not just kind of talking. Isn't that kind of a nice change? So he's got some new things. So we're going to be chatting with him today, and he stopped by for us. Thank you so much here. Welcome, Scott. Thank you for My coming. Thank you. I didn't realize you were from Brooklyn. I mean, that forever. Forever. <laughs> it's forever. So Brooklyn by way of California. But, you know, I can. that's what we do here. So welcome to I Didn't Know That. And we wanted to start with your most recent uh, excitement. You got a Ronald Reagan Award at CPAC. Oh my gosh, for those of you who don't know, the Ronald Reagan Award, yes, the Ronald Reagan Award is established in honor and is of an unnamed and overlooked conservative activist uh, who works in the political trenches day after day. I think that would describe you. Thank you. And you, you won it, and it's CPAC, for those of you who are unaware what CPAC is, CPAC is the Conservative Political Action Conference. And so we want to say congratulations, and I want to know, what was that moment like? Well, I was there with my mom and dad. They're sitting with their baby boy. And, you know, I'm <laughs> surrounded by all my colleagues, by my peers, by people that I look up to in this sphere. And so that was the coolest gosh darn moment of my life. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So, all right. And at CPAC, at that same time, you were quoted as saying, here we go. I got my handy dandy little notes uh -oh. here so I don't mess nothing up. Okay, so we got to hear, to our young viewers, this was a favorite of mine, to our young viewers who are watching this conference, following your dreams and living a life of passion where you're determined to succeed, and who knows, one day you may be a dog walker on stage at CPAC. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did you go from how, dog walker to CPAC? What's your story? How did that happen? Well, I didn't think this would ever be my life. If you told me, Scott, you're going to be traveling the country, registering voters, and picking up trash, I would have told you that you bumped your head and lost <laughs> your mind. But I have to give homage first to President Obama, because I graduated from college. I couldn't find a job. I started walking dogs for a living. Then I worked at an elementary school. While I was working at the elementary school, President Obama was reelected in 2012. And it was that night that I pointed the finger back at myself because I wasn't angry at President Obama, I was angry at me. Where was I knocking on doors? Where was I registering voters? Where was I being an active participant in our constitutional republic? And so I started getting involved. I volunteered for the Republican Party of Virginia. I fell in love with it because I met wonderful people like you. And in 2014, I told myself, Scott, you're going to get a job in politics. <laughs> I applied all across the country. And the reason why I'm always wearing cowboy boots that our viewer can't see, but rest assured I am. 
I moved to Texas in 2014 to help elect Governor Greg Abbott. And then after we won that election, I was like, I love this. I love that I feel I'm making a difference and I feel like I'm empowering people to affect change. And I knew how important the 2016 election was because we had the late Antonin Scalia who, bless his heart, passed away. And I knew how important that vacant Supreme yeah. Court seat was and I did not want Hillary Clinton to be the one <laughs> <laughs> appointing that nominee. So I spent two years of my life making sure that Hillary Clinton was defeated, an accomplishment that I'm very proud of. <laughs> and after that, I knew that politics was the life for me, and it was something that I was good at, and it was something that I wanted to dedicate my cause to. So for the last four years, I've traveled the country, training thousands of volunteers across the country how to register voters, how to become community organizers on the right side. <laughs> and in 2019, I was invited to the White House, and yes, again, it was one of the coolest moments of my life. I even flat ironed my hair. <laughs> <laughs> you, you flat ironed, wait, I, we need to stop the show for a moment. You flat ironed your hair here? Wow. I did. Listen, I was about to see our man. I had to make sure that I was looking presentable and <laughs> And so my brand and my story is I started off very humbled in the doghouse and with grit, with determination, and despite obstacles, I went from the doghouse to the White House. And President Trump also inspired me in 2019 because he brought up the situation in Baltimore. Mm, and I yes, saw that everybody was quick to point the finger quick to blame, quick to judge. And I thought, why is nobody coming up with a solution? Do something, anything. And so I tweeted out to my followers and I said, I'm going to Baltimore. And then everybody wanted to help. And it was at that moment that I was like, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> because I have to deliver. I have to keep my promise. So we didn't sleep very much for six days. I drove my mother crazy. <laughs> and on a Monday, a work day, we had 200 volunteers coalesce in West Baltimore, one of the most dangerous and dirtiest streets in the country. Mm -hmm. And we picked up 12 tons of trash in 12 hours in one single day. After that, I went home to my mom and I said, Ma! <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> I'm good at picking up trash. <laughs> And I always joke that at that moment, her heart just swelled with pride. <laughs> because her son, that baby boy, that dog walker, had turned into a trash collector. <laughs> <laughs> and so, again, I never thought I'd be sitting in this chair. I never thought this would be my life. I'm blessed. I'm grateful. I'm deeply humbled. But even though I'm an average, ordinary American citizen, the reason why I'm sitting before you is because I dared to do something extraordinary when in the society where people are so often to say, who will, I dared to say, I will. Wow. That's it, that's my story. <laughs> And we're learning that right now. We're learning how important saying I will is. Well, and I think especially for the faith community, and this isn't a dig, I'm saying this to be helpful and to be beneficial, but one thing that I hear from our faith viewers is that they have faith in God, and that's great. And I love that they have faith that everything will be all right in the end. But I think the two most powerful things are faith plus action. You know, it was Jesus who told us that we were going to be expected to have fish brought to us, that we need to go out and to fish ourselves and to train the teacher to teach the teacher. And that's kind of what I see my role in this, that it's, it's wonderful to have faith and it's important mm -hmm. to have faith, but it's also equally important to couple that faith with action. So love with action. Yes. I've heard you say that a yes. lot. Yes. I've heard you doing. scream that a lot. Yes. I have <laughs> screamed it on street corners. <laughs> <laughs> love, love with action. Yes. And that's what we had in Baltimore. Yes. And one of the newspapers went after you for that, didn't they? They did. The Baltimore Sun criticized me yeah. 
they thought that I had ulterior motives in traveling an hour and a half outside of my community of Virginia to travel up to Baltimore because I wanted to have fun by go picking up trash <laughs> and needles and whatever other debris there is out there. And, uh, you know, I was a little taken aback by that. I've never really quite been criticized for picking up trash <laughs> before. I'm an Eagle Scout. I'm the son of a retired Navy captain. I'm the grandson of a retired Navy captain. I always joke, I don't know what happened to me. <laughs> and, you know, we picked up the trash. And after we were done, I wrote a letter to the editor because I wanted the people to know this. This wasn't a one-time deal. This wasn't a stunt. This was something that I'm going to come back to the city of Baltimore over and over. And we have, by the way. I've done either four or five cleanups at this point. I will be coming back to the city of Baltimore. And I wrote a letter to the editor saying, you know, Baltimore son, I'm coming back. Why don't you join us? Why don't you roll up your sleeves, put on your work boots, put on some gloves, and help us pick up trash in your city? Spoiler alert, they didn't help us. <laughs> <laughs> mm, OK, so now we kind of know where they stand. Bless them. Bless but their hearts. Bless their hearts. <laughs> bless their hearts. So you've gone around, you've gone around, you're picking up trash. And you've also picked up hearts. You've picked up momentum. You've picked up life. You created an unexpected, I guess you call it a movement. This is a movement. This is a movement. I'm accurate in that. You created a movement, and was that unexpected? Did you think people yes. would just come out and help you pick up no. trash, and that was kind of going to be it? No. And we're done. That's a wrap. I and thought it was going to be my mom and dad <laughs> <laughs> in Baltimore picking up trash, <laughs> having people give us weird looks like we had lobsters crawling out of our ears. <laughs> And no, I never, ever expected this would be the result. And uh, the coolest part for me, you know, not that I'm being ageist, but in a world where politics doesn't usually have young people get involved, yeah. I think the coolest part for me is when young people, especially under 18, message me and they go, I'm so inspired by the work that you do. Because even though I'm a young man, I'm very forward thinking. And I'm constantly thinking of, who am I going to pass that torch on to? Who is the next generation of leadership? And so I'm inspired when young people are inspired to take action by my work. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very fulfilling. Wow. Scott, I remember when I first saw you. I think it was Baltimore when you got on, on my radar. And it was cleaning up, and it was the love with action. And you attracted people from all walks of life. And that was unexpected. And it became kind of a scary situation to the other side because suddenly there was unity going on with groups that don't normally talk to each other. And now they're talking to each other. They're working together. They're liking each other. Oh my gosh, they're having a hamburger together. What's going on? People were freaking out. Has anything about that, what has been a most, like a poignant story? I saw in Baltimore you took a picture with, I think she was a hundred and some years old. She was a sweet lady. She wasn't that old. She's she was, gonna hurt you for that. No, one. no, no, no. There was. She was. A, she was a, like a, a grandma. Her name was she was Miss Louise. Is that Miss Louise? And at the time, Miss Louise, I'm so sorry. Do not at kill the me. At the time, she was 80 years old, young. Since then, she's 81, I believe now. And uh, and she thanked us. She came out and saw the work we were doing, and even thanked the former president for bringing a spotlight to her city, which was in need of help. You know, trash is not political. Nobody deserves or wants to live uh, in that kind of a situation. And so, you know, Miss Louise definitely touched my heart. But one story that I think is relatable to California that I'm, I'm very proud of, and it shows you the ramifications of just one person saying, I will, is we did a cleanup in Van Nuys in Los Angeles area of California. And it was a piece of federal property that the homeless community was living there, in addition to tons and tons of trash that was leased out to the city of Los Angeles. The city said they weren't going to clean it up because it was federal property, even though it was leased out to the city. I know, that's government for you. And so we actually had permission from the homeless community to come in and clean up the trash. And we cleaned up, and I'm not giving you a hyperbole, I'm not exaggerating, we cleaned up 50 tons of trash, 50. And this is extremely important to note that this is an area of the country where we do have
Typhus. We do yeah. have bubonic plague. Mm -hmm. And how neglectful of us to allow a society where we are allowing human beings to be living among filth where they can potentially pick up some sort of bacteria or virus from living on the streets. But the moral of the story is not only did the homeless community come help us and they were helping to pick up that trash and we donned, we were the original mask wearers, by the way. Oh, that is true. And we even and the had hazmat on suits. hazmat suits. I do remember that. And after cleaning up the 50 tons of trash, an NBC reporter, con NBC, shocker, contacted me months later and said, Scott, I want to let you know that the area that you cleaned up has stayed clean. And several members of the homeless community that were living there in the streets are now safely into housing. So simply because we said I will, simply because we did the trash cleanup, we were able to make a cleaner space for the city. And we were also able to help change some lives and get them into a safer situation. So I think that's one of the most proud moments mm -hmm. for me. So it just started with an I will and picking up trash. And now we have lives that were changed. So that was love plus action. Yes. So it's like God kind of got to just work through all that. So now these people who are homeless, some have housing, some have, they have all these options they didn't have before, all from picking up trash. Yes. Wow. I don't know if you ever saw that coming. So politics, is there anything on the horizon for you? You knew it was coming. You knew we were going to ask, are you running for office? Are you? you know, at this point, um, I am listening. So if he would like me to run, you know, I'm waiting for a big old sign to go in my direction. <laughs> but at this point, I'm going to use my platform. I think that I'm exactly where I need to be, and I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing at this moment in time. And so I'm going to uplift others. I'm going to continue to connect people together. And I'm traveling the country helping to pass election integrity reform to make sure that we have fair and free elections, because without it, we no longer have a democratic republic. Number two, I'm teaching people how to run for office. And I want them to run especially for school board, city council, mayor, state rep, state mm -hmm. senate. You know, I do like that so many people are encouraged to run for federal office for Congress, mm -hmm. but we need to understand a bottom-up approach that if you want to take over the government peacefully and democratically, I have to say that, then that means <laughs> that we are going to take over at the city level first. And think about COVID for a second. Mm -hmm. Governor Newsom and the uh, liberals have been able to shut down your state True. in part because they controlled the city councils, they controlled the mayorships, they controlled at the city level. And so if we're able to harness power at the local level, we can make sure, for example, that we are protecting business owners. We are protecting children by having in-person learning if parents choose that's the best uh, relationship for their children to have. And so that is what I'm working towards right now. Okay. You've also done some um, teaming up. Mm -hmm. with a hashtag walk away. Some of you may have heard that with Brandon Strzok. Mm -hmm. And you guys were in San Francisco, I think it was probably a couple years ago, maybe now, a year, two, a year or two ago. 2000, it was right before COVID hit. So January or February of 2020, we did San Francisco. Okay. And you'd gone up there and interestingly, Brandon had all kinds of interesting things happen with the event. Mm -hmm. Things got canceled on him, all kinds of things. But during the day, they had a trash pickup, mm -hmm. and people were actually upset with you for picking up trash. In a, mm -hmm. I love San Francisco. My mom was from there. It's a great town. I, God bless them. We need to pray for San Francisco. But as you were out there, you were literally challenged mm -hmm. physically. Someone wanted to physically assault you, saying that you were disturbing the homeless environment uh -huh. by picking up trash, because I remember seeing this on there. And I didn't see a single hostile moment from you. You were polite to them, and you didn't let somebody hurt you, but I also didn't see you lash out at the same time. But this person was right here, and they were like, you were disturbing. And they, I don't know, if, did you get to finish picking up trash? Or they oh, quite yeah. They didn't derail us. They didn't distract us. I was there on a mission. Now, I've only been protested once ever in my entire life at a trash cleanup, and that was San Francisco, California. And they were yelling at us, bigots go home. And so I went up to them, and I said, as they were yelling at me, you know, I had to yell so they could hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't peacefully, you know, say back to them, 
Um, and I yelled back, will you help us pick up trash? Will you help us pick up trash? And spoiler alert, they didn't help us pick up trash. But you know what? That's the beauty of America. Listen, I have the freedom to travel to the other side of the country to pick up trash. And they have the freedom that if they want to spend their Saturday protesting a trash cleanup, I mean, would do whatever floats or vote, but I just don't think that's a great use of time. And in fact, if I were Antifa, or if I were the lefties or the opposition, you know what I would have done? If they were really smart and strategic, I would have organized my own trash cleanup and done a bigger, badder, better trash cleanup and done more than Scott Kressler. So I think that just shows you the, the, the lack of um, intellectual capacity that some of the, the lefties have of understanding, navigating politics, but that's okay. You know, we're not gonna be mean, we're not gonna name call, we're not gonna low blow, we are here on a mission. And for example, when some of um, my volunteers were trying to go back at it with them, yeah. I encouraged them, no guys, we're here on a mission. We're here to pick up trash and their goal is to divide us. Their goal is to distract us. And so I made sure that everybody promptly was going back to our mission of going back into the field to pick up trash. Yeah, I remember. I remember seeing that. I think they were just they were sticking up for you. They wanted to mm -hmm. make sure they were. Nobody they was going to hurt Scott. No, they're not going to hurt me anyway. I'm six foot five. <laughs> they're too smart. That is true. Did you have any moments in San Francisco, maybe that didn't get on camera, that were kind of poignant or, or sweet, mm -hmm. or something happened? Did, maybe did the other side? Was there any reachability? Was there a, a moment in there that you'd like to talk about? Um, not specifically San Francisco. I mean, mostly I get a lot of different messages. You know, I get a lot of <laughs> very hateful messages. But that's okay. Really? Yeah, I always respond back and say something like, you're really cute. <laughs> <laughs> you're so handsome. They hate that. <laughs> because if we're nice when they're mean, we don't give them what they want. And it actually infuriates them even more <laughs> because their goal is to bait us in becoming a nasty person. So then therefore they're able to have their self-fulfilling prophecy and then say, see, see, I told you this is what he was about. So I don't give it to them. But no, I love getting messages like this. This is um, a frequent message I get. Scott, I don't like you. I hate everything about you. But I love your trash cleanups. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I actually love that message. I really do. Because I have somebody who disagrees with me on policy, ideology. They agree nothing with me. But they respect me because they know I take action. And they respect me because I do. And so if I can get somebody that hates me to respect me, it's powerful. And that's how we can change politics. That's how you can reach across the other side of the aisle. Mm -hmm. They may hate you, but they'll still respect you. Yes. And still talk to you and still work with you. I and get something done. Imagine that one. I respect Stacey Abrams for her hustle. I don't agree with her ideologically, but I respect her work ethic. I don't agree with AOC, but I respect that she went from bartender to congresswoman of the United States government because she hustled and she knocked on doors for two years straight. So that's something that we need to work on as conservatives too, is I think sometimes we're quick to poke fun or point the finger and sometimes we don't even respect the other side when they have good work ethic, even if we disagree with them ideologically. So I think this is something that happens on both sides of the equation. It does. We're kind of known for the memes. <laughs> We're kind of like the, the king of the memes, doing yes. all the meme pictures and all those. Um, okay, Scott, now that you're out here, now that you're doing clean, you're actually going to be doing a cleanup this weekend, mm -hmm. right? You're going to be doing one in Huntington Beach? Huntington Beach. Is 1.30, that? we're meeting at the pier. Everybody, come join us, please. Um, no masks if you don't want to, no restrictions on people. We're just going out there. We're going to be registering voters, picking up trash. We're working with um, Turning Point USA is going to send a representation. Black Sit is sending representation. Election Project California is sending representation. So this is very much a team united effort. 
Okay, and for election integrity, right now mm -hmm. you're focusing on the states that kind of have Republican kind of everything. Well, I'm, I mean. I'm focusing on all 50. However, I'm trying to empower people with the knowledge that, for example, in states like Florida, Georgia, Ohio, Arizona, those are states that have a Republican governor, state house, mm -hmm. and state senate. So, for example, in a state like that, there's no excuse why they couldn't pass election integrity reform. Now that's going to be more difficult in a state like California, and I'm just saying that factually, I'm not saying that to discourage anybody because that's not my goal, but I'm saying that people need to understand how powerful they are because I think the average American, the average voter, really doesn't understand that even as one person, you have an immense ability to affect change if you choose to harness that power. I think we're all realizing. I didn't realize grassroots politics was this. I mean, Tip O'Neill said it to us for like years. He said all politics was grassroots politics. And I always concentrated on, of course, the president, things like that. But like, I don't have kids, so I never really concentrated on the school board. You know, or I didn't concentrate. And now we're seeing the results of me not doing what I was supposed to do. So I think I'm having the same experience you had. You weren't upset with President Obama. You weren't upset with, you were looking in the mirror at yourself, what did I do? And now you're going around, you went from trash cleanup, you're still doing that. So how did that transition happen? Where did you start getting the idea to register voters and register things? Um, my life is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's so complicated. Well, you know, it's, it's been an evolution, it's been a journey. So I quit my job at a non-for-profit leading up to the 2018 elections because I couldn't be political. And I wanted to do everything in my power to save the House and save the Senate because I knew they would impeach President Trump if we lost the House in the 2018 midterm elections. So uh, unfortunately, we were not successful in doing that. But after the midterm elections were over in 2019 in January, I remember saying to my mom, and I was like, Mom, what the heck am I going to do? I'm unemployed. I have no money coming in. <laughs> I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. And I saw a need for voter registration. Nobody was talking about it. Nobody. Mm -hmm. And especially not on the conservative side, not on the right. And I thought, okay, Scott, just like I told myself, Scott, you're going to get a job in politics. I said, you are going to travel the country, and you're going to teach people how to register voters. Meanwhile, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. <laughs> I had no clue how to start, what to do. So I created a PowerPoint presentation, and I got my first call to do a training in Connecticut. 100 people showed up in the middle of nowhere. Then I went to Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina. Over 100 people came to that event. It was at this point that people understood Scott is bringing out the numbers. Scott has something going on here. And then my phone was just ringing off the hook. And basically, from I'd say March of 2019 to November 2020, the presidential election, I was in a new state, in a new city every single weekend, mm -hmm. and in two years, I've traveled to 29 states, including Hawaii, and to show you that I'm a man that takes this job very seriously and professionally, I did not even dip my feet in the Pacific Ocean oh. Hawaii. Oh. Because I wanted people to know Scott Pressler is here to work. Mm -hmm. I am not jet setting and just having fun, but I'm doing this as a uh, professional and that I actually care about getting the work done and uh, it has been the best decision I've ever made and mm -hmm. so now after the 2020 elections I thought to myself again I remember saying to my mom <laughs> what was your I mom's thought, reaction to all this <laughs> um mama bear <laughs> sometimes cries because she's worried about my safety mm. uh, but mom and dad are so proud. They are over the moon for their baby boy, and they're so, you know, because you want to leave a legacy when you have kids, I'm sure, right? And mm -hmm. I think that this is a legacy that they can be proud of. And honestly, as a son, and I, I'm not just saying this to say this, I'm a son who's proud that my parents are proud of me, and that means everything. Mm -hmm. You know, because all you want to do is make them happy. Mm -hmm. And so, where my life is going now is I understand that without fair and free elections, we have nothing. 
<laughs> and so my immediate goal is I want to make sure that we're passing legislation across the country, like we just did in Georgia. Yeah, I was just going to say you did in Georgia. election integrity legislation, mm -hmm. and that's a part of people at home making phone calls, lobbying their legislators, pushing for that election integrity reform. And most importantly, I want to inspire people to run for office and teach them how to do it. And so it's cool for me because almost every day I get a new message from somebody. Scott, I'm running the school board because of you. Scott, I'm running for city council because of you. And that is the coolest thing. Yeah, because we, we need to get back involved. Because like in the 50s, people were very involved, whether it was baking cookies, mm -hmm. whether it was flipping burgers, whether mm -hmm. it was knocking on doors. We were very involved. And somehow through the electronic age or something, we just sort of got a little bit disconnected. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of bringing us back to that. Like you're talking about election integrity. I think most of us kind of know what that is, but just explain kind of sure. what you're doing. Yeah. Election integrity means bringing trust back into the system so people can know that their votes are being recorded and that it's recorded for the person that they voted for. So for example, I'm asking people when they lobby their legislators to ban Dominion voting systems, mm. to ban electronic voting, to make sure that we have paper ballots so there's a paper trail to make yeah. sure that we have a record of how votes are recorded. And last, I am asking to make sure that we have a system that when somebody unfortunately passes away or moves to a different county or moves to another state, that they are punctually removed from the voter <laughs> rolls. And notice I said punctually, not years later, but we're talking about a system where people are removed so that way they don't receive yeah. a mail-in ballot to an yes. address that they no longer live at. And so that is election integrity. Kind of like what we had going on from the presidential election. We had a little bit of all of that going on. People getting things that weren't so right. And so did you ever, did you ever think that you would be doing this? No. Ever? No. What was your degree, by the way? I no, know you got a degree. justice, so clearly I went into politics. <laughs> <laughs> you, had, you have a degree in criminal justice? What, mm -hmm. you, what was the plan to? And. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Hang no, on, I, let's write no, that down. I three point. <laughs> brains, but I'm just joking. <laughs> no, listen. Um, Criminal I justice. I wanted to be a border patrol agent. Un poquito, soy un gringo. <laughs> and, um, and I mean that with all due respect, and that's a term of endearment. <laughs> but no, I wanted to be a border patrol agent, so I was applying to go through that process while I was working at the elementary school. I was applying to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. I know my mom thanks God every day <laughs> that I am not a police officer. Mm -hmm. And then during that time, President Obama inspired me. So, no, I never thought this would be my life. In fact, I've done everything from pushing carts at Giant, which is kind of like a Kroger, a Walmart, a shopping center. I've worked at Abercrombie and Fitch. I have worked in elementary school. What did you I do in the elementary school? I worked as an administrative assistant in the front office, so I had 800 moms and dads. So mm -hmm. I just called everybody mom and dad because <laughs> I couldn't remember everybody. <laughs> and I even at one point wanted to work at Enterprise, and I didn't get the job. And uh, and it's funny now because I recently I told my mom and dad I was like, you know, I think I want to go into real estate, and I want to get my license, and I want to buy up properties and you know, make some income that way. And it's funny because my mom and dad, who never thought this would be my life, and always <laughs> pushed me away from the entertainment industry, or <laughs> entertainment side of life. Now it's funny because they're actually discouraging me from going into real estate and really? encouraging me to go on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it, the role reversal has been very interesting for me. And it's funny because my dad's like, but you're so good. <laughs> you could do one American or something. Yes. You could, actually. So, um, no, I'm, like I said, I'm blessed. I'm grateful. I mean, whoever thought that I'd be right now, my year is planned out. For up until December, I'm wow. going to 20 different states. Everything for this year is planned. I'm getting phone calls constantly. I'm getting gubernatorial and senatorial candidates calling me, <laughs> me. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a very humbling experience. Is there any plans for television at all? I know you've been on The War Room Call me. with Steve Bannon. <laughs> So Steve Bannon, I know you've done some. Any any I'm any plans of maybe starting your own podcast or starting no, your own? No, I'm not a podcast person at all. No, no podcast. I'm, I'm more 
I'm more spontaneous. Maybe a reality show? Um, yeah, as long as... Your style? As long as it would be wholesome. <laughs> as long as it's wholesome, certainly. But I think the only thing that inhibits me from having a normal job, um, of maybe even going to television, is the fact that I'm always traveling now, you know? So I think that's the one thing that's um, limiting me in, in that regard. And you said your whole year is planned. You have It's planned. You have senators and people calling you. Really? So what do they want? <laughs> well, they want they want to chat. They want endorsements. They want to talk. They want advice, and um, and that for me lets me know that I'm on the right trajectory, and it lets me know that the things that I'm talking about are relatable, mm -hmm. and uh, so it kind of it tells me, Scott, you're going in the right direction, which is good. Wow. Well, Scott. Anybody, I mean, as we're going along here, I know we're not quite at Q&A yet, but does anybody in our studio audience here have any questions or anything they want to ask, or do you just want to keep chatting? Well, first, want to chat? I want to tell people kind of what I stand for. So, you know, I know that we are maybe not, you know, pushing a political ideology here, so I'm just going to say, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative. I, I mean, I am a Republican, but I think what I'm really fighting for ultimately is I'm fighting for America first. And I understand that there is a problem because both on the D and R side, you need to understand the difference between globalists who want to put the rest of the world first and people that are America first and want to take care of our people. And number one, I don't think there's anything wrong and I'm not going to apologize by saying that I have a loyalty first as an American citizen that my allegiance is to the American people yeah. first. And, and to clarify, that doesn't, matter what your skin tone is, what your creed is, what state you were born in, even if you were born in another country and you're currently an American citizen, my allegiance is first and foremost to you. You're my brother, you're my people. And, and so therefore, especially in a state like California, where as we were driving here from Los Angeles, the thing that really breaks my heart is the homeless epidemic. Oh. And the fact that we are taking care of illegal immigrants when we aren't taking care of homeless veterans, when we are taking care of our people, when our people are suffering and struggling. And it seems so often that America is so compassionate and is yeah. so willing to lend out a hand to everybody else, mm -hmm. but here we aren't even taking care of our struggling citizens first, and, and that is something that breaks my heart. And so when I talk about America first, I mean stop giving money to China, mm -hmm. to Pakistan, mm -hmm. to Honduras, to everybody else. Rebuild us first. Rebuild our roads. Rebuild our schools. Rebuild our infrastructure. Make sure that we have the best and brightest here in America. Yeah. And a big thing for me is also trade. I believe in mm -hmm. tariffing other countries that tariff us. And if China is going to punish us, why are we then going to bow down to China and to mm -hmm. say, thank you for tariffing us, and as a reward for you, we're not going to do anything about it. No, I think <laughs> that's foolish. And so I like President Trump's policy mm -hmm. of leveling the playing field by having a tariff against other countries that punish us. Let's yes. level that playing field. Let's make America competitive by having low corporate tax, by making sure that businesses are going to want to do business here yeah. in our country, mm -hmm. not sell it overseas to other people. I want to secure a border. I want to make oh, sure yes, that, that's and, and that's for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons. If you think about it, if you really care about safety and security and the well-being of children, for example, then anybody, D or R, would want a safe, secure border. I just saw a video where two people, I don't know if they were coyotes, I don't know if they were smugglers, I don't know who they were, but I watched a video of what looked to be um, a heat sensor video that you know detected the presence of heat, mm -hmm. and I saw these people drop two what appeared to be toddlers, mm -hmm. children, over the side of the wall, over the border, and then they proceeded to leave on the other side for the children to bend for themselves. And I think that's a crisis. And I think that if you care about children, then we need to make sure that we have a way that if people truly are refugees, truly, 
and they are trying to get away from crime or they are trying to get away from whatever situation, domestic violence, that they have a way that they can come legally to the country and in a way that isn't going to put their lives at harm or at stake. And so that's kind of what I'm fighting for. I'm fighting for this America First ideology that puts our people first and that is as compassionate as possible but first understanding that our compassion first and foremost goes to us, to our people, to taking care of us first. That's actually Bible. Yeah. The Word actually talks about that, about somebody taking care of their house before they take care of everybody else's house. And you've got, and they, I, I know that video that you saw. I saw that same video. I think the number is up to 117,000 mm. uh, unattended children, I think is what they call them, mm. that are just wandering around there in the desert because they know Border Patrol, Compassion, mm -hmm. America, we're not going to leave them there. We will pick them up because that's just kind of who we are. They're, we're not gonna, they're abusing, and it's unfortunate. But they know that we are compassionate, and so they are using that against us in order to fulfill their ulterior motives, which is unfortunate yeah. that they're using children as a byproduct of that. Yes. And you're right on the tariffs instead of taxing Thank you. people. <laughs> instead of taxing Thank up. Thank you. You, know, you might want to visit, you might wanna it's visit the governor's house on the way home. Let him know that. It's common sense. So, you know, I don't think anything I just said is something people by and large disagree with. And so we just need to do a better job of communicating and articulating our message to people and I think they will come and join us, right? And and do it in a way where I'm not talking at you, I'm talking with you, I'm talking to yes. you and I think there's a difference. I think there is and social media has changed that whole game because mm -hmm. now we're seeing children wandering in the desert, we're seeing people being dropped over the fence, we're seeing trash pickups, we're seeing a lot of the things that we wouldn't see before with social media. So social media has completely changed that game. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why you have senators and things now calling you wanting advice because they know we're watching the trash bag. We're watching love well, and action. Well, I have, <laughs> mm, well, some of the senators that are going to the border now, let's be real for a second. This is Real Talk with Scott. <laughs> they were in power just a few years ago and they weren't talking tough on immigration or the border like they are now. You only are seeing them talk tough because they're in the minority and they know that they don't have any power as the minority so they're going to point the finger at the other side and talk tough to try to win. But the fact of the matter is we won in 2016, we controlled everything, and they didn't deliver. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm focused on primarying, repealing, and replacing feckless leaders. Feckless. 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 Who talk tough and never deliver on their promises. And, and that's why we're seeing some of these senators go to the border, because they're applying that strategy that I just discussed with you, which is unfortunate, but... Yeah. It will be interesting to see who of those same people are talking the same way if we win in 2022 in the midterms. 2022, 2024. How about when we win? <laughs> oh, who said that? You're still. Oh, I, I, I have a question. Yes, I'm ready. Um, ahead. When you said you knew that you were on the right trajectory, mm -hmm. what does that mean? How are you determining what a correct trajectory? So for somebody that is thinking about, oh, He's poking my buttons. I need to get involved. Where do I start and how do I know I'm on my personal right trajectory? What does that look like? What does that mean? Um, well, I believe success begets success. And the fact, I'm just looking at things that tell me, okay, Scott, your message is relatable. Um, and the fact that I've planned out my year, that tells me that I, I have something of value, that people want election integrity reform, want to run for office, that, that just tells me the success begets the success, and I believe I'm going in that trajectory. Um, I mean, that, that's a really difficult question to answer because we all have our own journey. Ultimately, you have to ask yourself, am I fulfilled where I currently am in life? I mean, if you're a ma that has seven babies and your goal in life is to make sure that your babies are prepared for the world, you may be fulfilled. But for other people, 
you know, this is the opportunity to say, do I want more out of life? Is there more I can do? I think the thing that I think about the most and the reason why even when I'm taking a break, I feel guilty for taking a break is I don't want to wake up when I'm 50 and look back at my life and have a life of regret. And I don't want to say, Scott, you should have done more. You should have taken that opportunity. You should have done something different. And I think that kind of pushes me to reach for the stars, quite frankly. You know, if you're going to dream, dream big. And if somebody laughs at you for doing that, well, I've been laughed at. And <laughs> look, I went from, like you said, Doc Walker to the stage at CPAC. So I think that anything is possible. I don't know if that answered your question, it but I tried. Yeah. Did you want to take another question? I can. Does anybody in the audience have anything they want to ask Scott? And we'll a bunch of you. Oh, okay. Hang on. Let us just get the mic to you, so then that way we make sure we oh, capture it for our for Zoom you. folks. Okay, ma'am. Um, there we go. First of all, you know, thank you so much for what you've been doing. Uh, people like me appreciate, you know, p people like you. And this is my question: Is trash picking your only uh, 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 method of of uh, voters uh, uh, registration? Uh, no. Uh, great question, and thank you for being here with us. It's, it was kind of an evolution where I was doing these trash cleanups, and it would happen in neighborhoods, and nobody had ever seen anything like it, you know, going into a neighborhood and picking up trash in West Baltimore, so all of the residents would come out of their home and come talk to us. <laughs> and it was such an interesting dynamic because they were all like, what is this? Who are you? And that was an important time that we could have that dialogue. And I figured, wait a second, if the people are coming to me, why don't I also make sure that they're registered to vote at the same time and make sure that they are empowered? Because ultimately, if they start voting and if they start directing their city council members to do something, then they will have power to make sure that this gets cleaned up without an outside source having to do it. And so I just kind of coupled the two things together. But no, I, when I train people how to register voters, go to Home Depot, go to Chick-fil-A. You basically want to go wherever people are and just talk to them. Now, you guys, for example, agree with me. We share the same conservative values and principles already, right? So you guys are probably already registered, and we share that same value. I want to talk to people that really don't agree with me, or maybe are the independent voter, or maybe even are the Democratic voter. And so I'm going to go out to talk to the most amount of people and make sure are they registered to vote at their current address. Now, I'm, I'm open to other things. I mean, women's shelters, food banks. You know, I'm open to a variety of, you know, community service projects despite just cleaning up trash. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay. Does anyone else have any, any questions? Do we have anything online or anything? Oh, we have a hand up over here. We have almost like Bob Barker and The Price is Right. We're coming. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I don't know how well I can word this, but uh, the topic is election integrity. Mm -hmm. And we have what seems to be two, two fronts. We have the people who cheated. I mean, they clearly cheated and wanted to cheat because they thought this was, was the Republican Party was, was fostering the devil incarnate, and so they wanted to cheat to, to, to stop him. And that was very sad because I, I, I love our President Trump. Uh, but there's the other aspect, and you mentioned it, and that is the electronic cheating. And I am very, very concerned about that because no matter how much we fight and try and win votes, I don't know if we are if the vote voting is true now. I suspect it. I suspect that the when they talk about the quote black vote, I don't even know now if that's really true because if you can manipulate it electronically, then you can people will just assume oh this particular group votes this way, therefore we can tweak it by 30% and no one will suspect anything. So, 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 my, and so my, and, and most importantly, what can you say publicly about the, the D's and R's that are in power that are either not doing much of anything to stop it and, uh, and what can we do? Mm -hmm. 
Um, when it comes to your question, I'm just going to call it shenanigans, just so we're clear. But the uh, the shenanigans that happened in 2020, um, remember that we won before in 2016. And the same efforts that were utilized in 2020 probably happened in 2016 as well. But we overwhelmed the polls and we were able to break the algorithms because we, people need to understand that if we are going to fight back peacefully democratic, that we need to do the same thing and just get as many people involved knowing that there are going to be shenanigans and that means that we need to bring out even more people in order to offset those numbers. Now, I also believe in tough talk and that I think there were too many flotillas and too many vote parades when we should have had more people registering voters and knocking on doors and signing up as election judges and election workers. And I love fun, but I think that we need balance and moderation and everything. And that, you know, an important way of campaigning is to do all those different things, but to also make sure that we're taking off work on election day and signing up to be eyes and ears inside the polls. So if there are any shenanigans, we're able to catch it. And we can plot our phones and we can record it and we can make sure that the parties are alerted on that. Now, when it comes to the D's and R's, clearly the D's did not want the president to get reelected, and clearly there were some R's who wanted the president to lose reelection, and we're seeing that right now with people like Liz Cheney, Adam Kinsinger, Mitt yeah. Romney, Ben Sachs, Lisa Murkowski, uh, I will be working to primary many of these candidates, and I will be going to Alaska, Wyoming, Illinois, and in 2024, I will be going to Utah to help remove peacefully. Um, Mitt Romney, I have to say that. But the fact of the matter is there are people in party leadership who uh, I believe, I believe, may have strategically sabotaged the president knowing the Senate was at stake, mm -hmm. and their goal was to protect the Senate, knowing that if we lost the presidency, we would have a better opportunity of keeping the Senate in the 2022 election. And I think strategically that may have been a motive. I mean, I'm not going to say who, I'm not going to point names because I don't do that, but I recently just uh, tried to go to New Mexico and we were going to do a, the pecking order or reach out to the local party and work with them and the executive director for a local county in New Mexico basically said, excuse me, they said, we've got things under control and that we know how to register voters. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you guys don't win elections in New Mexico. So how do you have things under control? Anyway, I posted about that publicly on Twitter and I didn't name names because I stayed true to that and I stayed true to being classy. And it set up a firestorm. And really? Yes, firestorm. And Tell us way. about the firestorm. In a good way. Oh, now no, we want to know. Great things are happening now because I tweeted that. So number one, that person has been identified. Good news. <laughs> good news travels quickly. I told them. I said the truth will come out. You know, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. And uh, now the New Mexico GOP state leadership has reached out to me and we're going to be putting on an event together. Mm -hmm. So it just shows you that sometimes public pressure is a good thing and public pressure works. And now it's going to be funny because the grassroots is very fired up and they know who this person is that basically snubbed us for providing free, free. I don't charge a dime in doing this. I don't ask for a cent. I'm doing this out of the kindness of my heart. And, uh, and we'll see if we can remove those people from their positions of power and replace them with America First conservatives that actually want to win elections. So I encourage everybody to become whatever party you choose to be in. Become a precinct chair. Join your local party. Because how are you going to change a system unless you are a part of that system? So I'm asking you guys to become a cog in the machine in order to make sure that the machine functions better. Does, does that kind of help answer your question? Yes, uh, you definitely need to ban Dominion, and I don't know if you can. I think there's a lot of powerful people who have money and invest in it. There are, but we are, we are just as powerful. And I know it sounds cliche, but I think of that movie where 
he's talking about the sticks, and he says, you know, one stick on itself can break very easily, but a lot of sticks united together is very difficult to break. So think of yourself like the sticks. If we bond together and if we are unified in our mission, we can achieve whatever we want, quite frankly, and we proved that in the 26 elections. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Oh. We have one over here. Hang on, hun. Let us get a let us get a mic to you, so in that way we'll also be able to get it on the record. Okay. So um, in 2020, I was involved with phone banking and was a um, volunteer to uh, be a poll watcher. And uh, I wasn't aware, I guess my eyes weren't on the news, that uh, in July they changed the um, registration in California so you could register on the day of election. Mm -hmm. So um, instead of having time to see if they're actual citizens, they registered, they went online, and poof, they didn't even get a, a provisional ballot. So I thought, you know, how do we get uh, voting integrity when they just, someone just comes up and they have no proof of citizenship. How do they do that? I mean, so how can we do, how can we get new voting laws when we don't control anything in California? What do we do? And then the end in September, they, they changed other laws about your, the mail-in votes, they could be on a postcard, they could be on anything. It didn't have to be even on a ballot. I'm not gonna lie to you, California's gonna be hard. And I'm not saying this to discourage you, but I'm also not gonna tell you what you wanna hear and I'm gonna be pragmatic and realistic. So look, the one thing that politicians care about is staying in power, right? And getting reelected. And part of the reason why they don't act or why they don't listen to you is because we don't make our voices heard. When was the last time you guys talked to your state house member? When was the last time you talked to your state senator? Right? So this <laughs> one, this one's good. The rest of y'all. Mm. Oh, there was two. I'm kidding. <laughs> Does email? Yes. Yeah. Email but counts. The fact is, unless we consistently and constantly make our voices heard, even to our Democratic representatives, the fact of the matter is, why would they do something if they feel there's going to be no opposition and we're just going to blow over with the wind? and not even oppose them whatsoever. I mean, the Democrats, they oppose President Trump and oh. Republicans every single day, right? Yeah. So my message is I encourage every single one of you to call every single day, Monday through Friday, I'm serious, mm -hmm. until they put forth election integrity measures, even if you're saying the same gosh darn thing every single day. They need to know this is important and they need to know you care about it. And quite frankly, we just flipped a whole bunch of seats in Orange County, mm -hmm. and I think there's a tide that's turning here in California. But you guys need to create that movement, and just posting on social media, you can cut it. Just talking to your girlfriends about how much you don't like that Joe Biden's dog keeps biting everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I need you guys to be a little bit more peacefully aggressive in getting your politicians to take you seriously because they work for you. You hire them. You pay their paycheck to represent you. That is an honor for these people to have you be represented by them. Does, does that a little bit help? I know it's sad when this is a trifecta state government for the Democrats in the state of California, mm -hmm. but we also need people to run for state rep and state senate. So don't go immediately to Congress. I want people to run at the state level because if you care about passing law, then we need to win at the state level. Nathan has a question. <laughs> and Nathan um, is here representing the Leadership Institute, which is a not-for-profit 501c3 organization that does great work in helping to train conservatives, not only nationally, but also internationally across the globe. That's right. Thank you, Scott. And <clears throat> so you're talking about running for local office and why people shouldn't jump the gun and run for Congress or other higher office. What if they already are and they shouldn't be? Do, do, you, have a, do you have a way to talk people out of running for higher office and into running for something that, for one thing, they can actually win? How do you talk people into running for more local office and being more focused on a specific 
uh, county or smaller district or city or neighborhood or precinct? That's a good but difficult question. You know, it's hard because I want to encourage people to do something. But, you know, but then who am I to say if I encourage somebody to do something but it's not what I want them to do? <laughs> that's, that's a little selfish of me. And, you know, who am I to tell somebody what they can and, and cannot do? But what I try to do is I try to think of myself as a very pragmatic, realistic person. And so I try to bring them to the micro level of focusing on, you know, the district that you may want to run for is going to be an uphill battle. And it may be very challenging. And unless you're able to raise $10 million, for example, the likelihood is probably not going to be successful. But imagine if you scale that back a little bit, and if you focus on this district over here, that according to ballotpedia.org, for example, you know, has better numbers, better number of registered voters, is only X amount Democratic or Republican, that the likelihood of your success here is greater. And so I don't necessarily try to discourage them. I try to encourage them based on data by giving them a different solution. And that is the biggest criticism I have with politics, is if I'm going to point out a problem, Yvette, never ever point out a problem without coming up with a solution. So if you're trying to encourage somebody, then I wouldn't just tell them, no, don't do it for X, Y reason. I'd say, you know, you may want to consider this instead and then give them an additional option, an additional alternative. Does that answer your question? And then I saw this young lady. Okay. <laughs> My question is that how do we reach out to the kids because um, like my daughter's just turned 18 and she said one of her friends posted they her family got their check stimulus check and she said in four years from now I'll be able to vote and I'm gonna vote for Biden well we all know he probably won't <laughs> be there but you can go out, you've got the hair, you've got the boots, you've got the personality, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm a fat little old lady and mm -hmm. tr me trying to reach out to the kids and also give them some love because, um, you know, we have so many kids who are struggling so badly right now and also in our foster care programs, there's so many kids. And so I feel like we're going to lose them to this very liberal give give me more give me more give me more they don't understand and they don't they want to be it's like to be a victim is cool now not, instead of taking charge so do you have any um, suggestions how we can reach out to them places that we can go to try to do that because I feel like you are definitely more able to do that than most of us in this room um, well I'm gonna push back and disagree with you and here's the reason why Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders are not young, <laughs> not particularly cute, <laughs> and not particularly trim. <laughs> and they inspire young people to enjoy our political process and join the movement, right? Because they agreed with the message and they agreed with the authenticity. And so, I mean, what is prohibiting you from, for example, standing on a public sidewalk outside of a high school and making sure the kids are registered to vote or going out there with a sign that says, do you want your schools opened up? Do you want in-person learning? There's nothing prohibiting you from doing that legally. And I think of it this way. It's about who plants the seed first. Do we plant the seed of conservatism or is the opposition able to plant the seed of liberalism and socialism first? And whoever gets them first is going to win. Now, that child who said they're going to vote in four years, I'm presuming is 14 years old or around, around that age. And so therefore, she's still growing. You're not the same person that you are even in two years' time. So there's still an opportunity for us to win over those voters. But the fact of the matter is, unless we're out there and presenting a message, not only on social media, but in real life, 
we're going to lose the game unless we're out there. We need to be on college campuses. And remember, it's perfectly legal to be on public, state, college ground. Nobody can force you to leave. You can be out there with your clipboards and register voters and set up a table. I've done it. They can't kick you off. And if they do, record it. And we can make sure that people like um, attorney generals in Texas, for example, who will sue over this, that they will sue the publicly funded education systems to make sure they don't get that money from the government if they are going to exclude people for exercising their First Amendment and free speech. So we need to do a better job of exercising our rights. Does that help? Sort of? Some. Just remember, you're more powerful than you think you are. You don't have to be young. I'm a white guy who has success with the black community because I show up. You don't have to be a minority to talk to minorities. And sure, maybe the boots help. Maybe the hair helps. <laughs> maybe all that helps. But the fact of the matter is, I show up. And if you are unwilling, and I'm not saying you, but if you are unwilling to say I will and to do the work and to go out there into the community, you're going to lose 100% of your shots that you don't take, right? <laughs> That's okay. I mean, I know we have some folks on Zoom. No, I just, I just have one. Oh, I have. Well, first of all, there's the old quote: "The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing." Mm -hmm. um, but we also had one shout out of love for Scott, mm -hmm. one of the most amazing uh, lady by the name of Kathy T. One of the most amazing people with such integrity that I have ever met. From Kathy, with my little white dog Puccini, we met twice at a cleanup in Van Nuys and a seminar in Simi Valley. Big support for you. Where can we send money? I remember, is she, Kathy, if I remember correctly, were you the really nice woman that drove up with your dog and you delivered products? I don't, I don't think you stayed for the cleanup, but you were generous enough and nice to deliver some cleanup products. So if that's yeah. you, then I think I remember. <laughs> she had to drop off, but. She did? Oh, yeah, okay. sorry about that. But she just wanted to send her love and also wanted to know how people could support you. Thank you very much. Um, if people choose to, you can go to my website. Um, but no, I'm, I'm very open on this, that I am doing this not for monetary gain. And I want people to know my heart is in this for the movement. Um, so thank you for the support. And also, what do you do in your spare time for fun? God. Spare time. <laughs> <laughs> Travel. Honestly, I think I forgot what that is. <laughs> Basically just vegging out on the couch. I mean, I'll sit there and just watch. I know I know I'm in a church in a place that's very religious, but I really enjoy horror movies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm sorry. Nothing nothing bad. I just didn't, I can enjoy it. So I just like watching horror movies on the couch and eating a lot of food. <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> what did you call this? Real talk with Scott? Real now you got Scott. it. Okay, and I know there was some. I saw a hand. Yes. Okay. And this is Simone. And the last time I came to California, Simone was instrumental and a big help in making sure that I visited everywhere from San Diego to Orange County to Los Angeles to Ventura. And a part of the work that we did was helping candidates like Michelle Steele, Young Kim, Mike Garcia, and Simone was part of that. Well, I'm glad to have you back. So in Los Angeles, we have obviously a lot of actors, a lot of people in the entertainment industry. We have you know, moms who are staying at home or moms who are working at home, um, dads who may be laid off, and, and we feel this call to run for, I personally have a passion to run for local office, just awesome. a small. So I think a lot of, and I know we're going to cover this later tonight, but I think a lot of the viewers would love to hear, and maybe some people in the room, what steps would someone like myself, who I have 25 years in the entertainment industry and, and in ministry, and I've been a speaker and, and all the things. I've done a lot of different things, um, but now really feel the tug on my heart to make a difference at, at the local level. So could you maybe go through step by step? You're really good at, you know, linearly, lin linearly, linearly mm -hmm. something like that. Um, 
speaking, you know, really breaking something down. If you could do just a few steps, that would be awesome. So like, let's say for example, you want to run for city council. Well, for the first thing that I would do is look up the city that you live in. Who are the current city council members that are currently representing you? And then find out, now each city and each state is a little bit different, but find out which district you reside in and which city council member represents you. And ultimately, you know, if you have a passion to run, well, you probably have a passion to leave because somebody who currently is elected is not doing his or her job, right? And so the first thing I would look at is, is this city council member that is in my city that represents me doing the job? And you can look up different things like ballotpedia.org. I don't know if it always breaks it down for local level, but I know it does for some things like federal, for Congress, et cetera. And I would see how is that person voted? Does that person answer constituents? Does that person show up? Do anything, and if the answer is no, then it seems that person needs to be repealed and replaced, right? So I would look at things like how much money did that person raise to win their last race, and that will give you an idea of how much funding that you are going to need to be successful. How many people live in the district? How many registered voters are there? How many people voted in the last city council election? And, and I would do that for a couple years, because that is going to give you your base to say, okay, I need to reach 20,000 voters in order to win my election. And then that will give you an idea of, okay, if I need 20,000 voters, then I need to knock on X amount of doors for voters. And that means that if I need to knock on X amount of doors, I probably need to reach those people three different times. And so that is going to help you kind of figure out your timeline from now until election day on how many doors you are going to have to knock either yourself as a candidate or with your door knocking team per day and break it down all the way to the campaign uh, November election. And does that help? And so. And then it's coming up with what is your message if you're running for office? I mean, if I ran for anything local, number one, open our businesses, open our schools. And especially, you're talking about single moms. And I think we have a historic opportunity with conservatives and with the Republican Party, for example, to win over single moms and single dads and actually families. Because what we're fighting for ultimately is, I believe, liberty and freedom. And we're actually fighting for choice. And the left, they always like to say they're fighting for choice, but they've actually taken away choice. And they've shut down businesses. And they've shut down the ability for children to learn in person. So imagine if we came in and we said our message is, single moms, single dads, families, I want you to have the ability to choose how to raise your children. And if that means that you choose to homeschool them, that's fine. But you also have the option and the opportunity to send your children to in-person learning. You have that choice, and I'm going to fight for you, and I'm going to fight to make sure that our schools stay open. And if people are unwilling to do the job, then we are going to hire people that are willing to do the job and teach the children. But we are fighting for liberty, freedom, and choice. And so I think that is going to separate us moving forward. And let's show people that's our party. We're the party of freedom. We were the abolitionists, the original abolitionists, right? Sure. Does that help? Is that okay? Okay. Anybody else have any questions they want to ask? Oh, we do. We have one in the mm -hmm. front row. She's coming. Hang on. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting a we're getting a mic to her, so she so yeah. folks on. On camera and on Zoom, we'll be able to hear. <laughs> Can you run for RNC chair? Oh, gosh. Can you please? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Uh, yeah. Because no. the message currently is not good. And that's why it's it, like people are not connecting. Because I know, I know the RNC, they still want to push that whole, you know, we're that Democrats are socialist. That doesn't really work. And I realize it's because with America, us Americans were really blessed that we've never actually ex 
experienced it. So nobody knows. Like my parents know because they lived through it. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm just going by. I'm trusting my parents what they what they tell me. But like with kids, they don't know. Where are your parents from? Oh, well, South Korea. Well, I mean, but thankfully, because well, after the Korean War, okay. um, well. Pretty much America. My parents mm-hmm. say America saved us, uh, and like like look at South Korea. It's like the number seven economy. It's a small country, mm-hmm. and look at North Korea. Mm-hmm. I always tell people look at the difference. Absolutely, you know, great question. Um, socialism is seen as like this ambiguous, amorphous boogeyman, right? And I dislike intensely that that's the number one go-to. And again, they're pointing at a problem, but they're not offering alternative solutions. Like, at least with AOC, again, I disagree with her ideologically, but at least we know what the Democrats are fighting for. They have policy. They're saying fight for 15. They're saying Green New Deal. They're saying abolish ICE. They're Mm -hmm. saying Medicare for all. I do not agree with any of those things, but you know what they stand for. And so therefore, I think it's important that we're saying, no, I'm fighting for America first. I'm fighting for a secure border. Open our schools, open our businesses, put the American people first, rebuild our cities, not the rest of the world. And um, at this point in time, I do not have any intention to run for the RNC chair. Ron and McDaniel won't even call me. She will not even call me. She won't tweet me. She won't reach out to me. And um, I, I think it absolutely says something. Mm-hmm. And uh, and meanwhile, and again, I'm, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, and I hope it doesn't come across egotistical, but, you know, here you have CPAC awarding me the Ronald Reagan Award, and the chairwoman of the RNC won't even reach out to one of the conservative voices leading the movement right now, right? And I, I think the grassroots respects the work that I do. The grassroots does not respect the RNC or the GOP. And quite frankly, I wouldn't donate a dime to them until they start listening to the people. So um, I will continue to put pressure like I did with the New Mexico GOP, and it worked. It did. I will continue to put pressure, and that's my promise. Okay. Is that a question? Yes, Zoom question. Hi, Scott. I've been following you for a few years via Twitter and Telegram. I'm starting to reach out to entrepreneurs and creativepreneurs about using their businesses as platforms for messaging and cultural activism. Is your organization nonprofit or, or for profit? Have you experienced any pushback from the powers that be? Well, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, to that person that wrote in. I'm not an organization, so I'm not a 501c3. I'm just Scott Pressler, (laughs) private citizen, former dog walker. (laughs) But there's a couple reasons actually why I've done that. Some people say, why haven't you started a PAC? Why haven't you started an organization? And number one, I think that when you create an organization, sometimes the message over time becomes diluted. And I think once you inject money into an organization that it can become puppeted and it can have strings attached to it that again dilute the original message and intent. And right now, I'm completely independent, organic. No one tells me what to do. No one pulls my strings. And I think that's why I'm able to be more effective than if, for example, I were working for the Republican Party, because then you're going to have red tape and you're going to have a bureaucracy telling you what you can and cannot do. No one can muzzle me, and I cannot be canceled. (laughs) (laughs) No Um, cancel culture for Scott. So thank you. But yeah, so I'm I'm not an organization, but I just want to inspire people to take action. And what, what was the next part of that? There was something else? Sorry, I had turned off my mic. Hang on. Um, the um, and have you experienced any oh. pushback from the oh powers my that be? Gosh, yes, I've experienced <laughs> pushback. Oh my gosh, I've had to claw my way. Claw. Oh, I've had. Uh, I mean, look, the fact that Ron won't reach out to me, the fact that this New Mexico executive director just snubbed me. I mean, I have had major pushback, but I was determined to succeed. And I had the support, luckily, of you guys, of people like the grassroots. And, uh, and I didn't let obstacles get in my way. So that is my biggest advice. If you 
have something that stops you, just don't let it. I know that sounds so easy, but just <laughs> keep going. Go ahead, Danny. Speaking of that, um, one of the things we believe in around here at Awaken to Life is that you know our greatest growth opportunities come from our our setbacks. So, my question to you is: Could you share a couple of big learning experiences you've had through setbacks? Because you know, just reading about you and seeing what you've been through, I don't know of too many people that would stick with it. And you know. Per I like that your organization, or you call your website the persistence, because mm -hmm. that's, that's really what it takes. Mm -hmm. So can you share a, a couple of big learns from the opposition you've experienced? Okay, well, one quote that I love, that I heard from the TV show Made, which is so old school, but it was all about <laughs> giving kids the opportunity to uh, live out their dreams. You know, if they wanted to become a basketball player, it would help them. A setback is a set up for a comeback. And I really love that quote. Um, a big thing for me when I was working at the elementary school, and I just, I wanted a job. I wanted a real job. You know, not, not that working at the elementary school as an administrative uh, assistant was something I was unhappy with, but I wanted to build something. And I applied either once or twice for Enterprise, and I really wanted the job. Really wanted the job, <laughs> even to just lease out cars to people. <laughs> and I didn't get it. But, you know, even though I was depressed, even though I was discouraged, I didn't let it hold me back. And, and I said, okay, well, I've got this criminal justice degree. I'm going to go for, you know, policing. I'm going to try. I mean, I applied to probably hundreds of government jobs. You know, uh, TSA, everything from, gosh, being a parks and recreational mm -hmm. service person in Yosemite. I mean, I applied to everything under the sun. And just nothing was happening. And I just didn't let it stop me. I was determined. Um, really big setback. I'll tell you about high school one. Uh, I still look young. But <laughs> one big thing that happened was I really wanted to try out for the tennis team, and this was senior year. And when I tried out for tennis, um, the coach told me I just wasn't good enough. And this was at the, the end of junior year leading into senior. So I spent the entire summer entire summer working against the backboard over and over and over and then I tried out at the beginning of senior year and um, I made JV not not varsity but I made university I don't know does that count <laughs> yes <laughs> yes that counts um no I don't really have anything major I mean I think a, a big one like I discussed with you was not having a job <laughs> being unemployed, telling mom, what am I going to do, and creating a life. I think that's what I've kind of done, is I've created my life. Okay, I think you certainly have, and we're kind of, yeah, we're kind of rolling uh, towards the end here, so any final words you'd like to leave our audience with? Final thoughts. Um, I actually have a question. I have a question. Oh, Here, give, so me, sorry. give me your question. And I have a, a question. Would, would you promise me something? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> a woman asking you to promise something, that's always a little dangerous, isn't it? What? Uh, <laughs> 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 Apparently, this has happened before. Uh, just promise me you will never lose that conviction. You'll never oh. lose that fire. Promise, cats. I promise. Um... No, I just, I, I want people to, who watch this, to the audience that's in the room, I just want you to be encouraged to do something and, and to inspire others. You know, just live your lives. If you're not fulfilled, do something that makes you happy. Don't live your life wanting more and just willing to settle for what you have. You deserve to be happy and you deserve to be fulfilled. And, um, and life is short, 
You know, I just, I lost a good friend the other day, and she was a staple in Virginia politics, and she was just a bright soul. And it really makes me understand that, you know, life can be taken away from us at any moment, and that it is fragile, but it is beautiful. And I also want to say, um, I'm getting a little sentimental, but to you of, it, of you that are still fortunate enough to have your parents, nice to them. Gosh. Take care of mom and dad. You know, um, Mother's Day and Father's Day are coming up. Show them that you love and respect them, because not everybody is lucky enough to hit the jackpot that I've hit, that I have two loving, supportive parents that don't drink, don't do drugs, share true love, um, and support their baby boy needs. So do a better job of, of respecting um, your family, because I think that's the most important thing. Okay. That's it, I don't have anything else that's to it. say. Well, Scott, we wanna say thank you thank for you. coming by. <laughs> And for giving us a, giving us a little slice of your life. Are you okay? Are you crying out there? Are you all right, baby? Uh, and for giving us a little slice of, of life, of what's going on with you, and for letting us feel it and taking us on the journey with you. Do you guys feel it? Yeah. So I want to say thank you. Thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you to those of you on Zoom, to those of the studio audience. Mm -hmm. Thank you also for, for coming. Uh, we're right now Awaken to Life Center, we do a lot of things here, kind of like this, uh, because life is changing and we're all finding that we need each other and we're all finding out that we're a whole lot more important than we thought we were, no matter what we believe. So if you would like, we do a lot of things here, we do a lot of things with health and education, we do a lot of things also with prayer and helping heal people. It's about creating empowerment and life for folks. It's about creating that so they can have their dreams. So exactly like what Scott was talking about, so that they're not frozen in that can't do position. They can now go forward. So if that's something you would like to give into, if you would like to extend into, we would like to ask you to, to donate if you'd like to. Simply to have other people, I'm a volunteer here, you see volunteers around here, none of us get paid to do this for the exact reason he talked about. We do what we believe in in the local community. We were here in Borderline when the shootings happened here. We were here during the fires. When those happened here, we prayed for people, we helped people. We connected them sometimes, even if they needed mental or psychological help. We do that as well. So the idea is about creating the person from the inside out so they can get unfrozen. So we'd like to ask you to donate if you'd like to do for that. Uh, there's a little box on the way out. We're not going to accost you. We're not going to follow you home. We're not going to track you down. We're not going to do Did you donate? Did you do it? There's none of that. There's just, if you'd like to, it's there. We'd like to let you know that. So we can put on more events like this because we enjoy doing I didn't know that. We like putting on little tasty appetizers of things like that. So just so you know. So if you want to go ahead and donate on the way out, we'd like to volunteer to do that. You guys have been the best studio audience here. Thank you. Also, to those of you on Zoom, thank you. Thank you. We'd like to say thank you to the crew, the cast and crew who's helped out here. Denny back there on the camera. Jill was on the microphone. They're the directors here. Pamela, Zoom room extraordinaire. Thank you, my dear. And Marta, you would not have seen me without her because she's our camera person. So we thank you for that. And most of all, thank you for Nathan, wherever he is. Thank you, Nathan, for putting up with my 75 phone calls. I appreciate that. And thank you for coming. And if thank those you. of you out there, take the message today. Do something. Maybe it's a content creator like Mario is back there. Or maybe it's helping out like Simone was doing. Thank you for running for office. Maybe it's baking cookies. I suck at that. Go for it. Do something. Don't just sit still. Let's keep in contact. Awaken to Life, I think it's awaken2.life is our website. If you want to keep in contact with us, we'll be doing some follow-up on this. We'll probably have a follow-up blog or something to go out with this. So let's keep in contact. You are important. Thank you for reminding us of that. I needed to hear that today. So thank you. God bless you all. I appreciate that. Mwah. Nice.